Welcome to Mile 2 Certified Secure Web Application Engineer course. The core objectives of this course is to provide you with the knowledge you need to design and develop secure web applications. Through this course, we'll provide you with the knowledge needed to test web applications for application vulnerabilities. In order to achieve this, we first of all have to understand what web application security is. We'll understand the challenges associated with web applications and understand the most common web application security threats. It's important that we review the common defensive controls and mechanisms we can use in web applications. The area of web application security is critical for organizations today. Web applications provide the interface between untrusted clients, customers, and people for accessing our systems remotely, and the confidential data we hold on those customers and employees. It is necessary that we begin to develop secure web applications, that the application itself is built to resist the various attacks they could be faced with. This is a lot more, however, than just writing secure code. Secure code is one layer of the defense. The system must be installed on a secure infrastructure. It must be correctly managed and maintained. We have to build an application security architecture that provides for layered defense or defense in depth, where we use a number of different types of controls to protect our systems and data. We must develop a secure software development lifecycle process, a methodology that integrates and interweaves security into the requirements definition, into the design, development, testing, and finally the deployment operations and maintenance of our system. The system must be built to be secure at all points during its lifecycle. It's important that we understand how to test how to scan and how to measure the security of our web applications. We need to put in pro place proper policies and procedures that will assist us in ensuring that we have regular assessment, review and evaluation of our security controls to ensure that they are effective and will protect our systems. All of security is centered around the concept of risk. What are the risks and what could go wrong? What are the ways in which a system may be abused or misused for purposes for which it may never have been intended or where something may go wrong during the logic or operation of the system that could lead to a compromise of the privacy, integrity or availability of that system. Throughout this course, we're going to look at each of these topics in more detail. The idea of a secure architecture requires that security requires security at the hardware level, at the utility level, at the network level, at the database, through the various interfaces, right up to the application. But we must never forget that a core part of security is also the education and training of the users, that they know how and when to use the system in a secure way. We must develop a secure application through a mindset that requires the integration and understanding of the security requirements at all times during the actual development lifecycle. We ensure that the underlying infrastructure is secure, the network communications are secure, and the way in which we store our data is also protected from unauthorized access or modification. The software development lifecycle has been used for many years as a way to ensure greater success of software development projects. We need to add the security into that lifecycle so that security is also considered during each phase of the SDLC. It's important that security is something that is integrated in from the beginning, not something which we try to add in at the end of the project. Not all security controls work, and not all will continue to work. Therefore, we need to have secure scanning and assessment, policies, procedures, a schedule, a plan, a methodology that we follow on a regular basis. 
This will hopefully allow us to proactively discover any vulnerabilities we may have in our applications so that we're able to find, mitigate, and certainly eliminate those vulnerabilities before they get found by the bad guys or the adversary. This is done through a continuous process of review, scanning, and security assessments. We know that security is based on current best practice, but best practice is always changing. It's always moving towards a new standard, or a new level of security. And so therefore, a product that was initially built to be secure a few years ago may need refinement, may need modification to bring it up to today's standard of practice. Once we have understood and discovered where our vulnerabilities are, we then need to work and develop a plan to mitigate and address those vulnerabilities. Some vulnerabilities are much more critical or severe than others. Those must be dealt with immediately, where others may wait until a future release or a future update to the product. The ability to assess and analyze the level of risk associated with vulnerabilities is part of the skill necessary in order to ensure that we build a secure application that is focused on the areas of critical importance and does not waste time and resources on things that are not as essential. When we put in place projects then to address vulnerabilities, we very often realize that some vulnerabilities may need more than one initiative or more than one project to fix. So we put in place a roadmap of a series of projects built into a security program to address the problems that have been discovered. One of the ways that we will do our scanning and assessment is by doing penetration security testing, or often called pen testing for short. This is the process of testing, probing, analyzing our web applications so we can expose the security vulnerabilities they may contain. The objective of a pen test is to mimic or to copy the actions and behaviors of an attacker. Very often a pen test will use similar tools to attackers. So that we're able to find if our web applications would be susceptible to the common types of attacks and, and tools that are in use by the hacking community today. By using those tools and by executing a pen test, we should be able to expose and uncover any vulnerabilities we have in the application. These vulnerabilities may range from improperly set up access controls where a person's access is not uh, set up correctly. They have too high level of an access, for example, or they have a way to get around some of the access controls we have in place. We'll look for problems with input validation and input handling where a person may be able to execute common attacks such as SQL injection or cross-site scripting, buffer overflows, all of which are mitigated as the first line of defense through input validation. We want to make sure that if we send improper data at our application, the validation schemes will ensure that the values we've sent in are legitimate within acceptable ranges and in help to protect the integrity of the data and the processing itself. We need to ensure that people are truly authenticated to be who they are and that they have the correct level of authorization. Make sure that they cannot exploit session management and maybe do session hijacking or other types of session related attacks. We look for problems with data transmission where confidential data may be stored or transmitted in clear text or in a way that could be visible to other people. This is often accomplished through the use of insecure protocols or not providing adequate levels of encryption and protection for information which is being transmitted across network segments. The idea of a pen test is we want to find the problems.
A successful pen test is one where we've been thorough, comprehensive, and analytical enough that we have a level of confidence that any of the vulnerabilities that were there have been identified so that we're able then to address and fix those problems. An incomplete pen test may result in vulnerabilities that have not been discovered and therefore may remain just waiting for the exploit of an attacker at some time in the future. When we expose vulnerabilities in access control schemes, we're ensuring that we're following practices such as need to know. That a person, for example, who's looking up a customer record may not be able to see that customer's credit card information. We limit it to only seeing, say, the last four digits so that a normal person who does not need to see credit card data would not be able to see it. We ensure that information which should have been protected and isolated is not visible to those who do not have a business need to know. Many times it's these weakness in access control that have led to serious data breaches. We ensure that user input is validated. This is where a majority of web application security problems exist. We need to make sure that data entry has been validated to ensure that the data is accurate and is within then allowable values. When we expose the vulnerabilities in authentication and authorization, we want to ensure that people can only access things in areas of the application according to their proper level of authorization. We need to make sure that we enforce the protection of our data through things like data classification and ensuring that the people on our systems that are only granted access to those areas where we have not only need to know, but also least privilege. If a person only needs to be able to read data, they should not have the ability to modify, delete, or add data into the system. When we talk about session management, we're talking about making sure that we have unique sessions for every user. We make sure that we can track the activity of every user so we have accountability and audit capabilities. And we have to make sure that we have process isolation so the activities of one user would not be able to affect the activities of another user. We know that any data which is transmitted across networks and especially across wireless networks can easily be intercepted. We need to ensure that data which is being transmitted has been adequately protected. We must, of course, ensure that we not only protect the pipe or the tunnel that the data is going through, but also the endpoints of that pipe. It's at endpoints very often that a breach happens, allowing an attacker to use that secure tunnel in order to gain access to areas where they should not have been able to get to. The challenge, of course, with web applications is that they're open to the world 24-7. There's no limit on when people can access and hammer away at web applications. And therefore, it's not like a normal store which has certain operating hours, but that the web application can undergo hours worth of attacks and abuse through the night hours when nobody is watching and monitoring what's happening. They're easily accessible from anywhere in the world. Web applications are designed to be easy to use and customer friendly. And much of their operation is transparent to the user. Looking at page source and looking at the various operations of the application, many users are able to discover how the application works. In fact, a poorly written application that has a lot of its error handling up in the client side, which can result in the client being able to manipulate and get around the error processing that is there. This makes our job that much more difficult. We have to defend something 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We have to have in place a system which is resilient to attack. 
we have to be able to find the holes ourselves through activities as we looked at, such as penetration testing. So we can close those off before the attackers find them. Our challenge, of course, is that we need to find and close every vulnerability. The opportunity or challenge for the attacker is if they can find one hole, they are going to be able to successfully exploit our systems. It's easy to understand why applications are such a ready target of today, a target of choice. We know that for many years, network and network attacks have been common. However, it's applications that allow access to our data and to our internal systems. In many cases, network security has improved, making it more difficult and therefore attackers tend to look for something which is easier and applications tend to provide that easy playground that they can get into. A lot of our information, a lot of our business processes are accessible through web applications. In many cases, companies focus on applications that are built for customer use and for the customer focus, but with an inadequate amount of attention then to securing those web applications. The more and more we put new functionality into our applications, the higher the risk then that those systems will not actually be secure. In many cases, we have seen this. It's the various add-ins and the various other components that have been added in to make our web applications, you should say, more functional and more flashy that have actually ended up in opening up new avenues of attack. In addition, one of the problems is that very few developers and project managers are ever trained in how to deal with application security. And since they don't understand what application security really is, we can't even expect they would, that they would know how to discover the security requirements and how to design, develop, and implement a truly secure web application. In many cases, the business analysts understand business. The project managers understand how to manage a project. And developers are trained in how to write code. When a developer learns how to write code, they learn how to do various types of complex functions and business support activities. They learn how to write code which is, shall we say, pleasing and aesthetically uh, interesting for the users. But very few, even university courses, actually address application security. We see that it also, in many cases, people that are writing and developing web applications today have never had formal training in security. And we cannot expect someone who has never received any form of formal training to somehow magically have learned about the security requirements, risks, threats, and vulnerabilities. We know that some universities have begun to address security. But in many cases, this has been sort of a side topic and not a core part of the computer science program. There are a lot of reasons why we need to improve security. And not the least of them, of course, which is regulation. Many laws that have come out, both at the state and federal levels, but also other types of laws within industry sectors. We can see here that there are laws that cross across all industries and in privacy, for example. And there's ones that specifically deal with the integrity of data, such as uh, SOX. Sarbanes-Oxley deals with the integrity of financial data. We have uh, Graham Leach Bliley, which deals with then any organization which handles financial information. We have HIPAA, which deals with healthcare. So these are regulations built into an industry sector. We have also seen other initiatives to try to ensure the secure operation of our applications, to protect us from unauthorized disclosure, or to protect us in so many cases then from some type of modification of the data that is no longer accurate or trustworthy. 
We also have best practices within industry sectors. One example of that would be, of course, PCI. The payment card industry has a set of standards known as the data security standards. They also have the payment transaction standards and payment application standards that apply to any organization which is handling payment card data, such as credit cards or debit cards. It sets out minimum security requirements that should be built into applications for companies that are then dealing with payment cards. This includes the development of antivirus, change control procedures, policies, and also, of course, the, the use and development of secure applications. PCI also mandates that data should only provided on a business access to data should only be provided on a business need to know basis. If we look at that, we can see that this is a very good example, though, of how multifaceted security is. PCI requires not only the development, implementation, maintenance and operation of um, technical controls, but also the implementation and maintenance of then non-technical controls, such as policies, procedures and physical security as well. A good, robust security program will address all of those requirements. We see that our customers expect that we will protect their information. And there have been a number of lawsuits lately against organizations that have inadequately protected the data that they've been entrusted with. Inside the organization, we also know that the need to provide for security of our data and systems is a part of the culture and morale of the organization as well. We meet then the compliance obligations mandated by, by both law but also by internal policies, standards and ethics. We need to ensure that we develop a complete secure infrastructure for our systems to operate in, such as through network segmentation, firewalls and layered defense. We have to understand where the threats are because it's important that if I'm going to address a threat, I have to know where that threat is. People make up an important part of our security program. We need to be able to convey a meaningful awareness program, one which helps us to ensure that everyone is aware of what the threats and risks are and how they should deal with any of those threats if they are exposed to them. The point of security, it must be remembered, should never be to hinder or slow down business development. The point of security is to enable business, to allow the business to take opportunity of new technologies. And an important part of a good security program is to be able to allow new technologies to be adopted and integrated into our systems. So we build the secure infrastructure and operating environment for new lines of business, new technologies, new processes. We understand the threats related to emerging technologies and address those early before they have become a critical part of our systems. So then, what is web application security? As we looked at a few moments ago, web application security is the implementation of both technical and non-technical controls. We could call those administrative, physical, managerial controls. The intention is that each of the controls works together in an integrated manner to prevent any type of opportunity for a flaw or a breach of our web applications. We have many excellent technical controls, scanning tools, for example, to help us to look for any types of flaws. We have web application firewalls, which provide a very high level of security and protection for data coming into our systems. We do input filtering to ensure that any input that comes in is valid. But we back those up with administrative controls such as policy, 
through regular testing and having testing procedures, and of course, by doing training for our staff. When we talk about technical controls, technical controls, just like a firewall, can be either hardware or software or both, which are used then to secure web applications. There's a lot of different technical controls out there, ones that provide a number of different types of services, and many of them, of course, work together to provide a suite of security products and solutions. We know that some controls are better at certain levels. Many controls focus on network level security where others, of course, focus on application level security. We use technical administrative controls together because an integrated solution is the only one that will effectively work. A good technical control in the hands of an untrained user will be ineffective. A trained user that does not have the tools necessary to do the job will be at a severe disadvantage. When we talk about administrative controls, we mention the idea of policies. And policies set out management statement of intent and direction. They say what management considers to be important as far as the protection and preservation of our data goes. Policies, however, are nothing but written word. Those need to be backed up by actions through the use of then procedures, baselines and standards. These will allow us to integrate the concept of policy into the real world implementation then of the products and services we deliver. The idea of controls is that a control addresses a vulnerability. A control tries to ensure that the gap or the weakness that could be exploited by a threat is closed off. We can see that in many cases, there are different types of controls, and we will often use a series of controls of different types in order to provide an adequate level of security in a process that we call then layered defense. The idea of administrative controls is that in many cases, they, number one, drive the selection of technical controls because the technical controls are selected to meet the needs then of administration. But in addition to that, of course, the controls are built then <coughs> to ensure the correct operation and security of those technical controls as well. We need to ensure that technical controls are surrounded by policies, procedures, regular reporting, analysis to ensure that we have provided the right tools to the right people and that those tools are being used then in the right way. The highest level control we have is policy because it's policy that mandates the direction of the organization and policy is signed off by management as a way to specify what our requirements are. The idea security can be something which is hard to define. Security can be something which is almost an abstract, poorly understood term. For many people, when they hear the term security, they think of security as uh, something sitting at the front desk and checking ID cards. Or they think of security as ridiculous passwords that they have to remember but they can never write down they consider security to be almost a little bit of an inconvenience or something that gets in the way of them doing their job. Whereas for us that work in security and are interested in developing secure applications, we know that security is all about reliability. But we usually use the term availability, making sure that our systems and data will work when they're needed. We know that security can be defined as confidentiality, making sure that our data is protected. Personal and private data is not going to be disclosed to unauthorized personnel. 
We also know that we need to ensure the integrity, not only of our data, to ensure that the data we have in our systems is actually accurate. But we also have to ensure the integrity of our processing. When we develop a web application, we have to make sure that that application processes data accurately and, of course, without in some way improperly modifying or affecting then the precision or accuracy of the data and the transaction. So for us to define security, we often use these three terms, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, as a way to take security away from being a poorly understood concept that is based a lot on emotion or perception and give it a way to measure it. We can measure whether or not we're secure by whether or not we are protecting our data from unauthorized disclosure, modification, or destruction. Those are the old terms used years ago instead of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. We know that when it comes to web applications, there are many threats that exist in the world today. The one thing we have to recognize is that we will probably never eliminate threats. The fact that even one threat is removed just means that someone else is going to take their place. In many cases, threats are something which are beyond our control and where we'll try to, if we can, contain the threats. In many cases, there's nothing we can do about it. Many of our threats today, especially in the world of web applications, may come from other countries. And there's no way we can enforce any type of a uh, control over the pro proliferation of those threats. The threats we face or the threat sources that would try to do damage can be both internal and external. External threats such as low-level hackers just using tools written by other people. Sometimes we mockingly call such people script kitties. We have groups like Anonymous, which is an example of a hacktivist group which just seeks for the attention, but usually fairly low-level attackers. The script kiddies and anonymous hacktivist level have a very low level of true, should we say, capability or skill. And in many cases, they're relying on vulnerabilities that have previously been discovered by other people or tools that have been developed by other people. But our real fear today are advanced persistent threats, those which are either nation-sponsored or, in many cases, sponsored by groups such as organized crime. The advanced persistent threats are those professional hackers which have a very high level of skill. Therefore, we call them advanced. As high level of skill, high level of training, they are professionals. Their job is to try to break into our systems. And they are persistent because that is their job. They're not just bouncing around from target to target, trying to find a target of opportunity. In many cases, they are employed to try to break into this organization or break into that system. And they are persistent in the fact that they will continue to probe and search for possible vulnerabilities in that target of choice for as long as they can. An APT is not someone who seeks the notoriety of anonymous, but rather when they break in quite often does not make any noise at all, but sits there quietly on the system and quite possibly then doing damage. We have internal threats as well. Now, internal threats could relate to something like a disgruntled or unhappy employee. The challenge, of course, with that is that such people can quite often, out of revenge, do something wrong. One of the things we have to watch for is when people are leaving the organization, that they don't take confidential data with them. We have to ensure 
that we limit the level of access that employees have. So they're unable to cause a data breach. And we've seen this in some cases where employees who actually led to a data breach of the organization was because they had been disciplined and yet their level of access was far beyond what they should have had and it led to some type of a, should we say, unhealthy disclosure of data. We also have people come in as contractors and have to ensure that at the end of their contract they don't take sensitive information with them as well. Contractors often don't have the same level of, should you say, loyalty to the organization and may therefore do something wrong. But another real threat comes from the fact of a lack of proper, should we say, processes and policies and procedures to help prevent then somebody from doing something wrong. We know that in many cases, the reason for a breach was not malicious. It wasn't that someone was trying to do something wrong. It was because they were just made a mistake. A developer, for example, may hard code into a database, username and password, just to make sure that the process works more effectively and efficiently, not realizing that that actually created a serious risk to that system. In some cases, a developer who's under time pressures to deliver code may not build in all of the error handling because they focus rather on the core functionality first. And when that happens, we have to ensure, of course, that we have not then allowed such vulnerable applications to be pushed into production before the security has been adequately built into them. Everyone has to recognize that today's world of web applications is one which is under constant attack and no application can be allowed to go into production that has not then yet met its actual requirements. Some of the other vulnerabilities we have related then with, of course, web applications come into the areas of a lack of training. We mentioned before that most developers have no formal security training. They don't even understand security best practice. An example of that is we have a very good tool known as OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project. That outlines the top 10 vulnerabilities in web applications. But we commonly find that people that write web applications are not even familiar with that resource. And yet that resource, in many cases, could help them to ensure that they are not going to then uh, build in commonly known vulnerabilities into a web application. OWASP explains how those common flaws happen, explains how to test for them and how to prevent them. And yet we see many applications still being built with those easily avoidable problems. A lack of training is one of the greatest problems we have today in this field. Another problem sometimes comes down to a lack of management support. The business is often focused on getting the product in, making sure it works, and the business is not as interested in security, especially if security is going to slow down the development and deployment of the project. And management may not be willing to take the extra time necessary to ensure that the security functionality has been correctly designed, developed, tested, and deployed. We must ensure we have a mandate from the senior management team that requires the development of secure applications before they are allowed to go into production. There must be a mandate from senior management that all applications must be built with adequate security and that any existing applications must be brought up to a level of adequate security immediately. The other problem is a lack of acknowledgement. Things such as not even recognizing what the problems are. Living in blissful ignorance and thinking, well, everything must be okay because we haven't had a breach. 
In many cases, we could say that the reason we've not had a breach is maybe we've just been lucky. And in fact, we could have vulnerabilities that are there that just nobody's paid attention to us yet and been able to break in. Our need is to ensure that we have done the tests so we acknowledge and know where our problems are. We also need to put in logging and accounting so we've got a record of who is on our system and what did they do. So that in many cases, we would be able to, we can say, track any type of activity on the system. And that may tell us in some cases about probes, about uh, attacks that are still developing by going through the logs and having, of course, the logs that show what activity happened on the system. These are some of the common application threats. As we see, they will be covered in a lot more detail later. The main thing is that we can only address the threats if we know what they are. And understanding these application-related vulnerabilities requires knowledge of where the threats come from. We can have problems with weak client-side controls. This, of course, could allow that the client or the user of our web application can put in invalid data. We should do input validation out of the client, but then we should repeat that input validation back at the server. An important reason for that, of course, is that in many cases, client can bypass some of the client level security and if we have not repeated the input validation at the server, they would be able then to cause cost damage or get around the security we'd built in at the client level. Very often we find problems with weak authentication and authorization controls where people are able to get around some of the authentication, maybe by going from insecure to secure web pages and bouncing around in that way and finding ways around some of the security mechanisms. We also see that very often the access controls were not set up correctly and that could be not only the application level but down at the hardware or even network level as well. Or as we talked about before, poor session management. That a person can take over a session owned and being run by somebody else. This, of course, allows them to bypass the authentication and authorization controls that were in place. So how do we defend? The first thing we should remember is that the purpose of this course is to help us defend. There are many threats that are out there, but the comforting and reassuring fact that almost all of these threats can be mitigated. There's not a cause for panic or fear, because in most cases, it is not that difficult to be able to then understand how to actually address these threats, these common threats. One of the things we have to understand is to enforce the basic principles of security, such as we've talked about already, least privilege, layered defense, need to know, putting in separation of duties, and so on. So the core concepts of access control then mean that we put in application security controls that only grant a person the level of access they require to do their job. We make sure we validate all user input so we don't receive and accept malformed input, such as leading to buffer overflows or SQL injection attacks. We make sure that if the application is attacked, that it's robust and resilient enough to, number one, notice that it's an attack, and two, take corrective action to prevent that attack from succeeding. We should also, of course, monitor all our application activity. Have a record of what happened, who logged in, what did they change, as well as, of course, any other changes to the configuration or operation of the system. Having accurate application and system logs can help us to rebuild an incident after it happened so we can truly learn where the weaknesses or flaws were. 
We mentioned that web applications can be built as one more layer of security. Sure, we use network security, but the application is another whole layer that is built to defend against attacks. Using a series of hurdles is what we often call then layer defense or defense in depth. We also, of course, try to secure the environment, ensure that all the hardware is used, of course, in supporting the application is properly secured. The idea, of course, of securing the environment is we secure yeah, the hardware, the network, the building, the database, the server room, and even the personnel as much as possible. We try to minimize the attack surface try to reduce the relative attack surface quotient so there's less opportunities for an attacker to be able to exploit. Quite often this can be through combining and using uh, interoperable services, turning off ports, protocols and services that are not necessary. So we minimize our actual exposure and minimize the number of places we have to protect as part of our security environment. The idea of defense in depth is we layer the security controls. That means that if a person was going to try to break in, they would have to use a variety of different skills and tools to get through each layer. We'll put different types of controls at various places in the application stack. Everything from input validation, of course, to firewalls. When we secure the environment, it means very often we secure not only the code itself, but we make sure that the code is being developed in a secure environment. We make sure that the code is not going to be compromised during then the development process. In some cases, of course, this means we have to provide both physical as well as logical separation between coding areas, development areas, and the actual production areas themselves. We should ensure that web applications and databases are removed as much as possible from exposure to other types of, should we say, network services. When we minimize the attack surface, this is where we, of course, try to deploy similar functionality through the application. So we're using the same routines, we're using the same error checks, so that we make sure that once we have one that works, it's used everywhere. Now, often, of course, the problem with this, if there's a weakness, that means the weakness is everywhere as well. But at least it's one thing we have to fix. One thing that's always a good idea is to centralize processing rather than have processing being done at multiple locations. If we're going to have a secure SDLC, or we could say a complete web application security methodology, we have to start with people. We talked before about ensuring that developers, managers, project managers, and even quality assurance testers know what application security is and know how to test for it as well. We must make sure that mandate uh, management prescribes a mandate that requires the development and deployment of security. We must ensure that when we build a system, we do regular reviews to ensure that our security and risks have been adequately identified and addressed. Do regular auditing and review of our security controls and of course do regular tests through penetration tests as well as review of our application code to make sure we do not have logic flaws, do we do not have errors that are improperly handled and so on. We also use the tools we have available. Learn to deploy the tools that are available. Learn how we can use those to, in many cases, simplify the testing process. And, of course, learn the various technologies available that are, can be used to mitigate common vulnerabilities. The idea of defining web application security is the idea of creating web applications 
where security has been built into each phase of the SDLC. Throughout the design, coding, and testing, security has been a preeminent concern. This means we have to identify, first of all, what needs protection. If we're working on a new application, one of the first things we have to do is a privacy impact assessment. that will help us to identify if this application is going to handle any sensitive data and therefore needs additional protection. We identify the assets. We identify what is legitimate input and output so we can build in our access controls around that. And of course, we must learn in many cases to think like the attacker. So when we build our security, we build it from the perspective of what would an attacker do. This is going to help us to be far more effective then in able to being able to identify where the security controls are necessary and ensure that we can mitigate the security vulnerabilities. As web application security engineers, we need to know what we're doing. We need to understand where the vulnerabilities exist in a web application. We have to understand the types of threats and also the, what are the various accessed through this application. We must understand how we can integrate security into the SDLC. The SDLC is moving towards the development and delivery of a product we need to ensure that we can bring security into that process. So we learn how to weave security into those phases. We have to learn how to communicate, to convince, and be able to explain to people why security is important, what it is, and how it affects them individually. A good web application engineer will be able to do pen tests. We'll be able to run a web application uh, hacking and uh, penetration test to do scans and be able to discover any vulnerabilities. They should be able to perform security code reviews to make sure that the code is written without any types of backdoors or other problems. And of course, they should be able to then perform risk assessments and threat modeling, which will help us then, of course, to ensure that our architecture also supports security through the use of things such as, you can say, network segmentation, making sure we're not keeping sensitive data, for example, in the DMZ, that we're using then network level of security with encryption and so on. And we are expected to be able to design and develop then uh, mitigating controls that will address the risks associated with the system. The idea of web application penetration tests, and sometimes called ethical hacking, because sure, we're trying to hack into our systems, but this is the white hat, right? This is where we are doing it with the proper authority in order to mimic then the activity of a true external hacker. A pen test is often a combination of different techniques some of them using automated tools that can perform various scans, but also using manual techniques to try and get around the security and bypass the security that is available at then the application layer. We can also use automated tools to do secure code review, go through our code and look for unreconciled errors or look for, in some cases, uh, a piece of code that would never execute. But some things must be checked through a manual review. And not all automated tools are going to be able to pick up all of the security code level problems that we could have. The architectural risk assessment, we review the design of the application. So we, of course, identify where there could be weaknesses in the design and deployment that could lead then to, of course, an application level of vulnerability. And of course, we design and implement then mitigating controls. So we're able to determine what are the best solutions to put in place, 
and that will, of course, reduce the risk of the underlying vulnerabilities. So the idea for us is that in many cases, there are different solutions available. We have to determine which is the best solution in our situation. Web applications suffer from a fundamental security problem. That is, that no input can be trusted. Anything that comes from a user could be manipulated or incorrectly put in by the user. And user input simply cannot be trusted. We must validate that that input is correct within its proper ranges and that that input also has not been designed to try to attack or in some way misuse the web application. This is done a number of different ways. Obviously, when we take user input, we'll try to ensure that we check it out of the client side. That'll allow us to correct a problem before it even becomes transmitted. And in the case of an error by user, that is the first good defense. However, since the user may bypass some of that user side validation, we will also do client side validation. This will try to ensure that malformed input by the user would not be able to then compromise then the application. This also will ensure that the user only has the correct la level of access to the various application functions and data. The idea here is that the input in many cases is the original source of the attack. And our system must be built to be resilient, to be able to detect or notice an attack, but also then be able to handle that properly to try to ensure that that attack is not successful. It is important for us to build the defense into our systems to be ready for these types of attacks. Since all web applications accept input, and, as a general rule, trust nothing. There are a number of ways, of course, that we could accept input, that is, of course, from users, or we could say from other processes as well. We can also see that it comes from form fields. It comes from, in some cases, uh, cookies or session variables. There could be mobile user interfaces or direct application program interface access. This is a problem we see currently today in banking. Many of the banking applications, the mobile banking applications, are very well written. Many of them are very secure. The problem tends to be in the application program interface or API that they are using. A number of companies are still using older APIs that can no longer be trusted. So even though they have built a very good secure application on the top, there is a level of vul vulnerability down below that that can be sometimes exploited. We also get input from other web services, data sources, and various feeds and so on as well. So this is where we use input validation routines. Now, to do input validation would seem simple, but it's not. It's not really that straightforward because, of course, there are so many different formats for data that can come in. And we have to be able to allow what is proper data, but still be able to filter that out from that which is incorrect data. Take, for example, a registration form. A registration form where a person signs up onto our site, we ask for their last name, email address, first name, phone number, and of course their address. So we turn around and say, what should the allowable characters be? In some cases, of course, we might try to restrict things like single quotes, since those could be used in SQL injection. However, that would mean a person with a name such as O'Malley, O'Day, would not be able to put their name in properly. We could try to eliminate script characters and other types of special characters. But in some cases, with a hyphenated name, that could be a problem. Even something as simple as a format. How do we format a telephone number? Do we use, for example, a country code with a plus symbol in front of it? Do we use dashes or do we use brackets around the various parts of the telephone number? In many cases, it's different in different parts of the world as well, as far as the length and structure of then a phone number. 
We also have to deal with the problem of field length. Many people can have a name these days that ex extends beyond the maximum 30 characters we used to use by default. Another challenge, of course, is the range of values. It's easy to turn around and allow, you know, months 1 through 12. However, what happens if a person puts in, for example, the 29th day of February? And one year out of four, we have to allow that. In other years, we don't. And, of course, if they put in something like the 31st day of September, our system has to be smart enough to recognize that September only has 30 days. So some of the challenges associated with input validation require a fair bit of, should we say, logical analysis to determine what values should actually be permitted. We also said that input can come from a number of other sources, such as hidden form fields or cookies, and even HTML header variables. In many cases, the average user doesn't see or is not aware of these. However, an advanced hacker is able to view and can alter some of these as well. Other things we have to watch for, of course, is the use of radio buttons, checkboxes, and select fields. Whereas in some cases, these can provide some restrictions on allowable inputs. They can be bypassed by a hacker in the background. So what are some of the ways we can do input validation? Number one, we can blacklist. Reject data that's not allowed. That means we'd have to know what is allowed and we'd have to make sure we validate the incoming input against the predetermined list of what is known bad data. Now, <clears throat> blacklisting is not the best for a couple of reasons. There's a number of different ways to launch an attack. There are, of course, things like encoding, Unicode, using other types of character sets. And some of these, such as, of course, many alphabets have additional letters in them, and different ways, of course, to express or to sign those letters, it can be difficult to put in all of the possible blacklist values. So therefore, as people adapt and work their way around some of the blacklist values, the blacklist itself will be then ineffective. The other idea is whitelisting as to say what should be allowed. Now, this means we would only accept data in the format allowed by the application. This is challenging because then we have to know all of the possible allowable values. In some cases, we will have to have little boxes that tell people things such as what format? Is it year, month, day, month, day, year? Uh, what is the format for a phone number? And so they know how our system expects that data be put in. When they put in a credit card number, do they or do they not put in spaces? So when we put in an input validation based on a whitelist, we will quite often find that our first initial whitelist may not allow all of the values it should have allowed. And there are some real advantages of whitelisting. The fact is that new innovative ways around it still won't get around the fact it only allows certain values. The problem is that we may actually cut off some of the legitimate traffic trying to come in as well. So this requires extensive research and testing. It's important that we control access, who gets onto our system, and what can they access once they get there. There's a lot of different levels of access, access to the application itself, but also, of course, then access to the various utilities, interfaces, databases, networks, and other sources and feeds that provide information and support for the application. We need to make sure that we have access controls that prohibit, for example, user access at the server level or the ability to get around the application itself and access the system through a different technique. Some of the ways we'll provide access control are through techniques such as session management. 
each user would have a unique identifiable session that identifies the activity associated with that one user's communication session. We will then provide proper authentication so we know that the user is whom they say they are, which may require the use of strong authentication or two-factor authentication, such as using two different factors to authenticate, which, which could include a password plus a token or smart card, a smart card. So we make sure that we try to ensure the user is who they say they are. And then we grant them only the level of authorization required for them to do their job, based on those principles we've talked about of least privilege and need to know. The concept here is all about providing appropriate levels of access control. If a person gains access to our systems, our systems therefore become at risk of compromise, of confidentiality, integrity, and sometimes even availability. We said that authentication is trying to ensure that the user is who they claim to be. Simple authentication is often based on one factor, such as a username and password. But when we add in additional functionality, such as the use of certificates, smart cards, even biometrics, this can increase the strength of our authentication process and avoid the problem of somebody, somebody being able to execute what we call a replay attack or being able to reuse the password associated with a certain username for a future login process. In many cases, in order to facilitate the operations of our systems these days, we will allow people to reset their own passwords. The problem with this is that we have to ensure that process also is secure so that no one is going to be able to misuse that password reset process either. Whereas authentication is validating who the person is, Authorization is giving them the rights, permissions, and privileges once they're on the system. Authorization is only given to authenticated people. And when a person is authenticated, we then grant them the level of access appropriate for their identity. This is where we ensure that we use controls such as view-based controls and masking that we don't display data to a user that that user is not permitted to see. When we set up a session, we allow a user to establish a communication session with our application. And we manage that through a session ID. The session ID is a unique value created each time a user logs in to an application. We usually track this via a session cookie. Or, in some cases, we've also seen it tracked using URLs or hidden form fields. There are risks associated with these, of course, because these can be viewed and possibly used then in session hijacking. The idea of the session ID is that it's a data structure that the server can recognize which communication is unique or associated with this user session. The idea of attacking through session management is targeted at then misusing that session ID. If an attacker can gain access to the session ID, then they could possibly take over or steal the identity of that session that belongs to another user. We also enforce controls about what data or services are permitted to the user, read only, read write, input data, or only view data. We need to ensure that we have a high level of granularity of the business logic to ensure that the users only gain the appropriate level of access. The details of access control can often be missed, and this leads to a person having a level of access that permits then an extended an attack. This could, of course, be through links out to printable documents or access to information stored in radio buttons, check boxes, select boxes. It could allow in some cases a person to gain access to pages outside the normal flow of the application. 
This is especially a problem when we have the session ID and URLs and so on. When we respond to attacks, we need to expect that every web application we build will be attacked. That should be the underlying premise of all web development. This application will be attacked, so therefore I need to develop a level of security to resist that attack when it happens. How can we do this? One, by logging and capturing what actually is happening on the system. By making sure we identify any type of error, exception, or abnormal operation. By sending notifications when there is some type of improper activity on the system to administrators so they're aware of an ongoing type of potential violation. When we capture unexpected events, we have to know, first of all, what is expected. So we're able to identify something which is outside of normal activity. We'll look at the types of errors and exceptions that people would normally make when they use the system. This will be based on the normal types of errors people make with data input or filling in the wrong field or uh, missing a field when they fill it in. And a lot of these types of anticipated errors will be built into the test cases we use when we test the application. However, there can be other types of errors that we have not even anticipated or thought about. These, of course, are difficult for us to ensure that we have addressed through the various error handling of the application. This will require us, in many cases, to try to be innovative and creative in thinking about how would an attacker actually try to misuse the system if they are doing so intentionally. When we have unexpected errors, the web application must be able to identify that this is something which is wrong and not permit that activity to proceed. Now this could be, of course, through some type of an error message that comes back. But one thing that's important is that our error messages should not be too verbose. In other words, when we send an error message back to the attacker, it should be a simple error message that indicates an error code and that they could call the technical help desk if they have a problem. Only the technical help desk should be able to see the detailed information about the error. And, of course, if this truly is an attacker, it's unlikely they will call in. But if they do call in, the technical help desk knows to be suspicious that there's probably no reason for that attacker to have encountered that error if they were a legitimate user of the system. It's also important that we do log the error so we can do the analysis to try to figure out what happened and how can we prevent that in the future. In some cases, this error could point out to a weakness in the actual then flow or logic of the application or the defensive infrastructure that needs to be then modified. The idea of auditing and logging any type of unanticipated or unexpected event allows us to see what's happening on the system. This allows us to do the analysis and look into the gaps in the application security controls. We use audit logs to gain an understanding of the activity quite possibly that was leading up to the attack as well. And of course, whenever a person does log in, we should log it whether or not it was successful. So we know who was on the system at the time. <coughs> and we also have a record of anyone who was attempting to get on the system at other times but was then prohibited. There are a number of things that we should put in our logs. Obviously, as we've just said, all login attempts should be logged, but also any attempt to access various security functionality, any attempt to change the configurations of the system, any requests that have been captured because of a malicious request or improper request, as well as we should log any transactions on the system. 
so we know who has done what on the system and when did they do it. When we have very sensitive applications that are handling extremely sensitive data, financial data, health data, we need to ensure that these systems have additional protection in them. Quite often, we will require enough log data to be able to launch a forensics investigation to determine what actually happened on the system in the case of some type of malicious activity. This requires a full record of the client activity and it also requires us to protect those log files so the attacker is unable to manipulate, delete, or in some way destroy those logs so they are not available for review. In many cases, it's preferable for the application to notify the administrators in the case of an attack. If we have an ongoing attack, it could well be that a notification of some type going out to the administrators can help us to take action while that attack is still in progress. That could mean, of course, the ability to shut down the system or terminate the session. It allows us to ensure that we are logging and tracking what's actually being happening. This immediate action may allow us to mitigate or contain the amount of damage we actually are suffering. It's important though that we do not become desensitized. If we have too many false alarms where alerts come out about possible attacks but they're not truly attacks, then the attacker, then the administrators may be desensitized to the point that when a true attack does come in, they don't even react. So the system has to be smart enough to differentiate between what is truly malicious and what is, say, normal human error. Some of the things that could, tr could trigger a notification then, you know, obviously a known signature of an attack, a known attack string, but other things could be, for example, a high, high level or number of requests from a certain IP address, which could indicate someone trying to do some type of an attack repeatedly from the same address. Or we look at where someone has attempted to modify hidden fields or what should not have been modified by a normal user. And that, of course, is where a cookie or hidden field now has an unexpected value. This is why we need to do server-side validation, not only of the input fields, but, of course, all fields being returned from the client. As we've said before, nothing that comes from a client should be trusted. In some cases, the ability of the attacker to compromise the security of an application is related to a problem with the administrative functions of the system. Things such as change control, the functionalities related to, say, the configuration of the application, the error handling, user administration, these types of administrative functions, if they are not also done with secure procedures, could allow a user to bypass security and gain direct access to data. There are a number of administrative functions that we need to put in or around the system. And of course, this of course would include things like how to change privileges once a person is logged in, setting up new users, hijacking sessions or even disabling the application. In all of those cases, we need to ensure that the proper security has been built into those systems to try to ensure that a person is not able to just set up a new user account or change their level of permission if it has not then, first of all, been from a legitimate administrator level account. So we know that in this review, we've talked about some of the threats, risks, and initial problems that face web applications. We know that a web application is usually built to provide a business function or business service. The problem is that many of them have not been built with an adequate recognition of the need for security we need to employ proper security controls for our applications. 
which includes understanding what function this application must be, be able to provide, understanding, of course, what web application security is and how to build it into that application, as well as understand how to support business needs, how to understand and support new technologies, new lines of business, and what are the key drivers which can include regulations for then application security. We need to understand where the threats are to the various web applications that we currently have in place or are uh, developing. The next section of this course is to set up the lab that we will use in actually doing some of the testing and lab work related to web application engineering.